let me just tell you, it is my truly, truly my unique pleasure to introduce to you one of the Republican, light, the Republican Party's bright lights, and a, a man I once called my governor, and now I'm even more proud to call my very, very dear friend. Please welcome Governor Mitt Romney. Hey guys, hey the conservative movement is alive and well, let me tell you, right here. Thank you so much. Boy. Well, once again, the people you didn't know were coming were even more exciting than the ones you did know were coming. With our Vice President and with Scott Brown here. Thank you so much, please. Jay is brilliant. I got to have him go with me everywhere. And Scott Brown, boy, I'd take him anywhere I could take him. I, uh, I want to thank those guys for generous introductions. They are national heroes and real treasures for our country. And, and of course, both of them have made real contributions to our nation, one in defending the Constitution and the other making sure we keep it strong and well for the years to come. It's, uh, it's good to be back with you. I love coming to CPAC. This is a great audience. And uh, I frankly can't think of any place I'd rather be than getting to be with you guys and to talk about the things we believe in. I, uh, I did have a great weekend, however. I spent, uh, spent the weekend in Vancouver at the Olympic Games, yeah. A few Canadians here, yeah. And uh, as always, the, uh, the games were very inspiring. But by the way, you probably, uh, you probably didn't hear the news this morning, uh, late breaking, that uh, the gold medal that was won last night by American Lindsey Vaughn has been stripped. Yeah, it was determined that President Obama has been going downhill faster than she has. I'm not, telling, uh, I'm not telling anything to you that you don't already know. Uh, our conservative movement uh, took a real hit in the 2008 elections. The, uh, the victors were not exactly gracious in their big win. Uh, the media, as you recall, uh, had their legs tingling. Uh, uh, Time magazine had a, a cover which, which pictured the Republican elephant and, and declared that we were an endangered species. Uh, the new president himself promised a change of biblical proportion. And of course, given the filibuster-proof Senate he got and the lopsided House vote, he had everything that he needed to deliver that. They won, we lost. But you know, you learn a lot about people when you see how they react to losing. We, uh, we didn't serve up excuses or blame our fellow citizens. Instead, we listened carefully to the American people we sharpened our thinking and our, our arguments. We, we spoke with greater persuasiveness. We took our message to journals and, uh, and airwaves across the country. And in the great American tradition, some even brought attention to our cause with rallies and tea parties. <laughs> I know that uh, we've all watched uh, very intently as the conservative comeback began in Virginia and then exploded under the scene in New Jersey. Uh, and, uh, but as a Massachusetts man, who like my fellow Bay Staters has over the years been understandably regarded somewhat suspiciously at gatherings like this, let me take just a moment to exult in the victory of Scott Brown. Uh, for that victory, by the way, that stopped Obamacare and turned back the Reed pelosi obama liberal tide, we have something to say that you'd never think you'd hear at CPAC. Thank you, Massachusetts. <laughs> so 2009 was the president's turn to suffer losses and not just at the ballot box, but also in bill after bill in Congress. 
and most importantly, in his failure to recognize that the economy needed to be reignited in a powerful, effective way. And, and also, as with us, how he has responded to his defeats tells us a great deal about him and his team. Now, as you recall, he began by saying that he hadn't failed at all. You, you remember he gave himself that B plus for his first year in office? <laughs> yeah. T tell that to the four million Americans who lost their jobs last year and, and to the millions more who stopped looking for work. Explain that to the financial markets worldwide that gaped at trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye could see. Square that with the absence of any meaningful sanctions against Iran, even as it races to become a nuclear power and of course it continues to fund terror. Uh, President Obama's self-proclaimed B plus will go down in history as the biggest exaggeration since Al Gore's invention of the internet. So unable to convince us that his failure was actually a success, he turned to the second dodge of losing teams. Try to pin the blame on someone else. Did you happen to see his State of the Union address? Of course, first he took on the one group in the room that was restrained from responding, the Supreme Court. The, the president found it inexplicable that the First Amendment right of free speech should be granted not just to labor union corporations and media corporations, but equally to all corporations, big, medium, and small. Of course, when it was over, I think most Americans felt as I did. His noisy critique and bombast did not register as clear and convincingly as Justice Alito's silent lips forming these words, not true. Next, of course, he blamed the Republicans in the room, first condescending to lecture us on the workings of the budget process, a process many of them in that room had, in fact, mastered while he was still at Harvard Law School. Uh, he, uh, he went on to blame Republicans for the gridlock that has blocked his favorite legislation. But, of course, he knows as well as everybody in the country does that not one single solitary Republican vote in either house is required to pass this legislation or was not until that guy just got elected. <laughs> it was in fact Democrats who blocked him. Democrats, Democrats who said no to his liberal agenda after they'd been home to their districts and heard from the American people. As Everett Dirksen used to say long ago, when they felt the heat, they saw the light. <laughs> God bless every American who said no. Of course, the, the president accuses us of being the party of no. It's as if he thinks that by saying no is by definition a bad thing. In fact, as you know, it's right and praiseworthy to say no to bad things. It's right to say no to cap and trade, no to card check, no to government health care, no to higher taxes. My, uh, my party, our party, can never be a rubber stamp for rubber check spending. But, but before we move away from this no epithet that the Democrats are fond of trying to apply to us, let's ask the Obama folks why they say no. No to a balanced budget, no to reforming entitlements, no to malpractice reform, no to missile defense in Eastern Europe, no to prosecuting Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in a military tribunal, no to tax cuts that create jobs. You see, you see, we conservatives don't have a corner on saying no. We're just the ones who say it when it's the right thing to say. And of course, that leads us to the group that he has most recently charged with being culpable for his failures, the American people. It seems that we have failed to understand his wise plans for us. If he just slows down, he reasons, and makes a concerted effort to explain Obamacare in, in words we can understand, if we just listen better, then we'll get it. A actually, Americans have been listening quite attentively, and they've been watching. When he barred C-SPAN from covering the health care deliberations, they saw President Obama break his promise of transparency. When the Democratic leadership was empowered to bribe Nebraska's Senator Nelson, they saw 
President Obama break his promise of a new kind of politics in Washington? And when he cut a special and certainly unconstitutional deal with the unions, they saw him not just break his promise, they saw the most blatant and reprehensible manifestation of political payoff in modern memory. No, Mr. President, the American people didn't hear and see too little. They saw too much. Here again, with all due respect, President Obama fails to understand America. He said, and I quote, with all the lobbying and horse trading, the process left most Americans wondering, what's in it for me? End of quote. That's not all what they were asking. They were asking, what's in it for America? 